Seven Habits of Highly Effective Websites. And while this isn't um, a, a complete look at how you should design a new website, there's going to be lots of information here that will help you have a long, healthy relationship online with your customer base and have a very effective internet marketing strategy. Now, um, Drew, go ahead and pop us over the next slide. Um, a little bit about our company, Online Potential. We've been here in Gainesville since 2009, and we're the only marketing agency here in North Florida that focuses exclusively on helping you grow via the Internet. We, um, we are very passionate about and we love helping people generate more traffic, um, increasing your brand recognition, and most, most importantly, we focus on the bottom line. Um, we're business owners. We understand what you're going through, and we know it all has to translate to the bottom line. So a little bit quickly about Drew. Drew is our senior marketing strategist, and I'm going to go ahead and let him take it from here. All right. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. I'm Drew Allen, and this is a little bit about me, just uh, for people who might not know. I was actually alerted that I referenced being pictured on the left, and just to clarify, I'm on the left in the picture as well, um, in case anybody was confused at this point, hopefully not. Uh, but feel free to uh, mention, follow me on Twitter or talk to me on Twitter if you have any questions or email me. I just like seeing businesses grow well and I like seeing them use the internet to its full potential, no pun intended for the company name. But So without further ado, let's just move on um, to go ahead and start. I'm not sure if Tony Robbins actually is the only person who said this, probably not, but he's the only person that I could find this quote attributed to um, on the internet, which is that if you want to be successful, you find someone who's achieved the same results that you want and copy what they do, you'll achieve those results. I don't know necessarily if, you know, he's the only person that said it, but it is a, a good principle, but it's not always that simple uh, the same way Oscar had to uh, explain to Michael Scott that you can't just declare bankruptcy. There's more to it than that. However, it's still a good place to start. From a blank canvas of not knowing um, where you're going with your website, from just a, a base level of wanting one, or you have one and you're not sure what to do with it, these are great principles to look at and try to employ when you're moving forward with your planning. So let's go ahead and start with the first one. Begin with the end in mind. Determine the purpose of your website. Your website needs a purpose. Highly effective websites have a clear and obvious purpose. What does that mean? It's just what your site is. What, what does it do? What should it be doing? Um, some great examples from the Internet. They're out there. Um, Wikipedia is a great one. It's a free encyclopedia that anyone can edit. We all know that's what Wikipedia does, and that's what it is. It's pretty much stuck to that as long as it's been around and it does it well. Uh, down for everyone or just me.com. Maybe this one isn't as obviously not as popular as Wikipedia, but it has a purpose. It has one purpose to check with that little web address bar whether or not a website is down for everyone or if there's something wrong with your ability to access the site. That's all it does and it does it perfectly and it's been very effective at that. Quora is another example. It's questions and answers kind of a professional, more of a professional setting than something like Yahoo Answers. Um, there's a lot of uh, professional level and technical advice here. Um, of course, as I say that, the top one is, what are some of the most profound jokes ever? Obviously, it's not without fun, but this is all this website does, questions and answers, and it does it excellently. Amazon, they wanted to sell books online. That's exactly what their plan was, and it's now, they still do that. They sell a lot more. But that's been their purpose from the get-go, and they've executed it well. One of the best examples is Google. Um, this is an example of Google's website from 1999. It's got Google at the top, and it's got a search bar, and that's really been simple. Search the web. And even today, you go to Google, and you see something very similar to that. So they've been able to expand, but their purpose has remained uh, clear and the focus has stayed there. So some homework for you would be to 
write down the three things that you would want a person to do when they visit your website. And go ahead and put uh, those in order of performance. Or, I'm sorry, go ahead and put those in order of importance um, because you really want to be able to focus in on that top one, the number one thing you want someone to do when they visit your website. And you can have that in mind moving forward so that when you're setting up your website and you're uh, allocating your time and your resources, you can make sure that they're going toward um, the most important things. This is really important. Great point, Drew. And, and, and I can't stress this enough. Um, here, here we tell our clients that, that you should think of your website as an employee, um, as perhaps your number one salesperson. And any employee needs to have measurables. You have to be able to measure their performance. And this is how you're going to measure your website's performance, whether or not they're actually helping visitors accomplish these things. So for us personally, our number one goal on our website is lead generation. We want to see more leads come through the Contact Us page or the other forms on the site. We want more people to sign up for our email list. We want more people to engage us via social media. And we measure those three primary goals on our site. So definitely come up with your own list, your own unique list. And maybe it's those three things or maybe it's something different. Habit number two, put first things first. You have to make sure your website is visitor friendly. Uh, highly effective websites are easy to navigate and easy to understand. They just work. And that's hard to really articulate any, um, in, in any more complex way than that. You, uh, they have a clean design. And um, speaking of design, uh, a website can be designed very beautifully. You can have a lot of graphics. You can have animation sliding in. Design is very important to a website. But what if this car had no doors? It's an absolutely beautiful piece of machinery, and I would love for the chance to drive it. But if there's no doors, in the end, I'm going to walk away frustrated because I wanted to drive the thing. I would, I'll go back to my Grand Marquis um, because I can get in it, and I can actually drive it. And the point of that being that function will always triumph over form. Form is great, and it's definitely something that you should be focused on. You want your website to look good. You want people to enjoy it aesthetically, but if it doesn't function, then you're really, really missing the point. Uh, this is a great example. This website, where am I supposed to click? What do I click on? As far as I know, I can click on cookies in the corner, but really, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. Something tells me that this is not actually a bakery of any kind, so I'm, I'm a little bit lost. And so it's important that you have a clean navigation for your website, that you know that people can come and just without thinking, they're able to interact with it and get to the places that you want them to go. Um, there's Beyond that, there's more things you need to focus on. One of the big ones being, is your website mobile friendly? There is an enormous amount of traffic nowadays is being done from smartphones, and you've probably done some of it yourself, um, but there's so much of it that it can't be ignored. You, you know, uh, visiting a website on a mobile phone can either be very pleasant if they've prepared for it, or it's just something daunting and, and really uh, frustrating to try to navigate. Another thing you want to focus on is avoiding flash. Flash is very flashy, again, uh, not intending the pun, but it's it, it, it can do a lot of things that look very cool, but if it's not employed right, um, and many of the, many times it's not, it's difficult for a search engine to see what your site's about. And beyond that, depending on the Flash website, it's actually more difficult to navigate as well. Again, the user needs to be able to navigate it easily. Uh, and again, touching on the search engines, if they can't see what your site's about, how do they know to put it in the rankings? How do they know to put it in the search results? And they, they won't. And you know that's missing traffic that could be coming to your website. And beyond Flash, there's a lot of other things you can do, um, both visibly on the website and in the code of your website, how to set it up to where search engines, um, search engines make friends with your website. And when, they're, um, when you're friendly to them, search engines can show your website more often, and more visitors will come to the site in general. So your homework here is, Go ahead and access your website from three different mobile phones. Um, 
just look at it. Just pull it up and try to navigate around it. Is it easy to navigate? Is it easy to read through? And more importantly, how hard is it to accomplish any of those goals uh, that we talked about earlier and have it won? Those, those are the real things. How, how difficult is it to do that? If you don't have a website yourself, um, pull up a competitor's website and that can easily, you know, you can kind of see how they're tackling it. Maybe you can move forward with your own plans to do something better or make it easier for users on your own website. Herb, do you want to? Truly, guys, I just can't stress, I, I can't stress what Drew is saying enough. Um, mobile phone usage is just incredible right now, and I, I'm sure all of you are, are smartphone users, but smartphone penetration right now in, in the markets is at 55% of overall mobile users. You're looking at about 129 million people just here in the U.S. that use, use smartphones. 94% of us smartphone users perform local searches for businesses and services. You have, you have to look good. You have to be mobile friendly. Your website has to be responsive. And it, you have to make it very, very easy for them to contact you. All right. Next, synergize and supercharge your content. I know that's a very tiny, it's a, it's a tiny connection there to the initial habit by uh, Stephen Covey, but you want to grab their attention and not let it go. Highly effective websites are written well. They're written very well. They're written to be entertaining, informative, and impactful to the readers. And I can't stress that enough. The writing is very, very important. Here's an example of a Facebook update or maybe something from an email that a company sends out which of these would you click? Just take a second, read them. Which one do you like better? Which one is more likely to get your click and get you to go read it? And I can tell you, if you're anything like me, you probably click the bottom one, even despite my hint. Uh, because, let's face it, pizza is more interesting. It's something particular. It's more engaging. There's actually grammatical errors up in the top one. There's a lot of things that you can do to optimize um, in, uh, the content on your website. One of the things is leveraging your expertise. You, in your industry, whatever it is that you do, you're an expert in that industry compared to all of your customers. You know more about it than they do. And you can share some of that knowledge on your website in a way that helps them and beyond helping them, it actually, they see you as more authoritative. That might, it seems like a no-brainer, but when you can share knowledge with your customers on your website, they see you as an expert in that field. And the more they see you as an expert, the more they're willing to trust you with their business. Also, there is no I in team. And meaning that, you have to involve your whole team. There's people at your business that do things, specific, specific tasks and, and responsibilities in your business that you might not be as familiar with. And if you can tap into their knowledge, again, it's widening your knowledge base in your industry and in your market and putting that on your website so people see and rate and raises your authority um, in, that, in that market and in that niche. One quick point right there, Drew, I'd like to make, though. There is an eye in interns. And if you're a busy business owner and wearing lots of hats, and you're looking at this thinking, gosh, how am I ever going to find time to work on my website? Leverage the incredible knowledge base that we have right here in Gainesville at the university. There, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of kids in the journalism department and in the engineering school that would love to come work and intern for local businesses to get that super valuable experience they need on their resumes. So put them to work. Um, interns are a great resource we have here. That is very true. Last but not least, Defense wins championships. That has nothing to do with your website, but it's very important to remember in life and um, most sports, actually. So, moving forward, your homework. Spell check and proofread every tweet, email, blog post, Facebook update that you write. Just start doing that, and you would be very surprised pulling those things into uh, Microsoft Word or Pages, whatever it is that you use and spell checking them and actually you know proofreading them specifically 
how many things that you'll overlook. Maybe it's a word that you consistently misspell and don't notice, um, or using a word in an improper context. And you don't think about it, uh, you're just updating for your business. And over time, though, people notice that. Customers notice when a business uses improper grammar. Secondly, read some of your blog posts. Um, if you don't have blog posts yourself, if you're still you know, in the process of starting your website and starting your blog, then find some blog posts in your market, in your niche. Um, find a competitor's website. Read the blogs. And I want you to just think about it in terms of entertainment value. Were they entertaining to you? Legitimately, did you enjoy reading them? Or did you kind of eh, force yourself to get through it? Because it's, it's very important. Uh, if, if it's your com competition and you had to force yourself to finish a blog post about whatever services that both of you guys provide, that's a fantastic opportunity for you to step in with your blog and write something that people would actually enjoy reading. And that's going to get shared more. That's going to get referenced more. It's just a fantastic opportunity. And for your own self, if it's your blog post that you're getting bored by, then obviously you should do something about that. Change that. Re you know, rewrite those things. Recycle that content into something that's entertaining and shareable online. Next point, seek first to understand your customers, then to be understood. Listening is the key here. You have to listen to your customers. Highly effective websites are well equipped to view and research the actions and intents of their visitors. This really boils down to four words, analytics. It's analytics. That's what I'm trying to say. And it, it's so invaluable. Um, it's, it's just extremely important to look at your analytics. Or if you don't have any, get some uh, ASAP. You can look at what your visitors are searching for. What are they reading on your website? What are the things they're reading the most on your site? And really, what are the things that they're not reading on your website? Are there pages that you spent so much time on and nobody stays on that page? They're always leaving. You should divert some of the time and energy to some of these other places. Um, look at, you can look at terms that they came to your website for but immediately left because then that's an, another opportunity for you to increase the content on your site in a way that's going to keep traffic on your page. Two more words, surveys. Yes, I know, just the one word. But when did you last have any customers fill out a survey about your products or your services, or more importantly, your website? Maybe not more importantly. For the purposes of this webinar, um, about your website. Because those things can provide so much value when you're just customers are just willing to communicate to you exactly the reasons. Maybe the reasons that they kept your business, maybe the reasons that they um, chose not to use your business. There's a lot you can learn um, and apply toward improving your business and your website. So your homework. Install Google Analytics on your website. If you need help with this, that happens to be something we can help you with. Uh, and beyond that, send a survey to your past customers or email list that you have about your website specifically. Just do it. I mean, there's lots of ways. Um, I think SurveyMonkey, um, and um, we can actually help you uh, set up a survey if you want to send one out and kind of process the results of that and translate that into actions to improve your website. SurveyMonkey is a, is a great tool. Um, um, Google Customer Surveys is another great tool, very affordable, and get, get great data out of it. Um, you can simply do direct mail surveys. Um, whatever works best for your customer base, just take their temperature and ask them for feedback. Um, it, it's priceless. All right. Be proactive. Take responsibility and take ownership of your website. Make your website about real people. And I use this image as a fantastic example. That is me and my wife at Niagara Falls. Her family lives up there. We were able to visit. It's the first time I'd ever been up there. It was actually really fantastic. Um, so you should go if you ever have a chance. Niagara Falls is awesome. They did not pay me to plug them. Highly effective websites have brands and biographies, names and faces. They tell stories because everyone loves a good story. There's so many brands and websites and companies that you might not ever consider you know, that do this, but there's still a face and there's still a name 
there's still a story that you know about that. For instance, Facebook is a social network, but we all know who that person is. You know, Amazon is another great story. If you haven't, if you're not familiar with Amazon story, Jeff Bezos in the image here, it's a fantastic story of how he got started, how he started the company, and it's the kind. His story is what helped boost it in the first years of its um, growth. Apple, everybody knows that face. Um, Colonel Sanders is another one. We all associate it. These are attempt. You know, the company is doing what they can to put a face and a name along with their product and service. Ronald McDonald being another example. Locally, this is still this is being done and being done well. If you ask for a pizza recommend um, in town, there will be a lot of people that tell you Satchel's is the place to go for pizza. And they, on top of having great pizza and a very interesting, unique uh, sort of customer experience when you go there, they're very, very personable. This, their website lists every single person, every employee that they have is on this page, and including Satchel. And that really ties into the uh, name and face recognition, the fact that there's an actual Satchel's, there, there is an actual Satchel at Satchel's Pizza. That's a huge contributor. Another one. Another great example of this is Student Maid. They're, they have a whole story here, the birth of Student Maid. And Kristen's done a great job of making the name and the face a part of the company. So your homework, revamp your About Us page. If you don't have an About Us page, you should put one on there, obviously, um, and include a real name, a real face. Put some actual history there about how your company first got started. This is going to help so much. They're going to see a name and a face. They're going to recognize the, something real about the company. And it's not just a random website that they stumbled on, but this is a, a, a real local business uh, with real people behind it. Next step. Did you have something to add there, Herb? Well, I mean, I just want to emphasize that, it, that the Internet age did not reinvent marketing. The Internet's simply a new channel that, it, that can greatly amplify successful marketing tactics. And there, and there are Im, immutable laws of marketing, and people buy from people they like. People buy from people they like. Um, so tell your story online. Let people know who you are. Um, tell people more about the, the what and the why behind your company. Um, it'll help. That is very true. Think win-win. This one has a lot to do with being generous. Just be generous. That's really uh, the simplest way I can put it. Highly effective websites are often charitable and are always resource-driven. And there's a couple, that's sort of two halves to this um, point that I'm making, the first of which is charity. You can sponsor local events. There are always stuff happening. With the university here in town, there's no shortage of local events going on at any given point in time. You get in touch with the right people. You become a sponsor to those events. That's a way that you can drive traffic back to your website. It's a way that you can drive customers back to your business. And again, it's, it's connecting. And not only does it actually uh, widen your exposure, but it, it actually puts a positive spin on your brand image as, a, as you're helping sponsor something. Um, Indiegogo and Kickstarter, if you haven't heard of these, they're both basically crowd, fund, crowd fundraising websites. You can start a campaign and have a bunch of people give a little bit to help raise a certain amount of funds, whether it's a nonprofit or a charity. Maybe it's a film project. Maybe it's a, um, a biz, an entrepreneurial effort that they're looking for some uh, capital to get started. If you can build a business profile on these and actually give, and this is really low giving we're talking about, $5, $10, $20. Um, we're not talking about breaking your bank here, but if you can uh, consistently give to a couple of these things at a time, it, it, just, it builds relationships and it builds your brand image positively on the Internet. Uh, driving traffic back to your site and um, increasing your brand exposure that way. Another one would be locally to host a fundraiser event. This one's fairly offline if you're um, talking about using your place of business, but you can, um, you could, there's lots of ways you can obviously use social media and expose the event online, which would again 
from traffic back, funnel traffic back to your website. Uh, but yeah, pick some of these local events and opt, you know, talk to them about actually hosting it at your place of business. And that's, um, you know, nothing but positive brand exposure there. Uh, resourcity, I promise it's a real word. Um, what you can do here is publishing guides. We talked about it uh, earlier uh, with the idea of leveraging your expertise. But if you can actually publish some sort of tangible resource, whether it's a, a PDF guide or some sort of actual guide online to help your customers do something, again, they're going to view your website as a resource, not just as a uh, customer business transaction. They're going to view your site as a place to go back to as a resource to help them. Uh, another way you can do that is to mine your own customer data. If you've been, if you have a business in a given industry that's been there, um, however long you've been in business, what you have in your own history is a large set of data to pull from in terms of demographics. What kind of uh, projects are the most difficult? What kind of projects are the most popular in a given area or a given region? Or with, you know, whatever your demographic is, there's a lot there that you can, you know, mine that data, publish it, um, and again, becoming a resource and a viewed as an authority in whatever your industry or whatever your market is. Another way to do that is to host an industry forum. And this one is a little tough because a lot of, a lot of times local businesses are very competitive and there's kind of uh, sort of a back and forth and there might be a little bit of uh, and perceived animosity there, but it, it really can build your brand positively if you're the one holding the olive branch and inviting other members and other you know, competitors in your industry to some kind of forum, some kind of event for that industry. And um, it's an opportunity for you, again, to show generosity, and that's the kind of thing that you will just reap so much back um, in positive I don't know, vibes. I can't think of a more tangible way. But there's so many things that can happen um, that build your brand and build your uh, level of authority in that industry. So your homework here, a lot of writing, I know, but it's very important. Write 400 words about your favorite charity or nonprofit organization, and then donate significantly to that uh, said organization. It doesn't have to be 400 words. Um, it can be 300 words, it can be 250 words, but just sit down and write about it. Write your thoughts and your feelings. Why is it your favorite organization? Why are you wanting to donate to it? Uh, publish that on your website somehow. Um, I guess that's more like your extra credit. But that's what's going to end up building your brand exposure and, and building a relationship there on a business level with a charity, a local charity or a local nonprofit. Secondarily, write 400 words. Again, I just picked 400 out of a hat. Could be less or more, but write about where you think your business niche is headed in 2013 and beyond. Write about the future of your market, of your industry. You know it better than your customers know it. Um, but your customers still, when they see a, something on your website about the future of pest control, the future of restaurants, I don't know, whatever your whatever your industry is, seeing having that kind of content on your website not only builds relationship with related businesses that aren't competition, but it builds your status as an authority in your industry locally. Last but not least, sharpen the social saw. And this is where you really need to be able to integrate social media into your website. Because highly effective websites use social media to allow visitors to engage with their website and with the content on it quickly and easily. And there's a whole lot of ways that you can do that. According to a recent study, the average person spends three hours every day on social media. And, you know, we, I definitely can't emphasize enough the importance of search engines and what they do. But people aren't spending three hours a day on search engines. They're spending three hours a day on social media. So this is a frontier that it's worth putting the time and effort into making your brand and website visible on. I'd love to hear r real quick, Drew, I mean, just from some of you, um, just in the chat would be fine. What are some of these social sites where you personally spend your time? Um, are there social sites that you tend to spend more time on? Maybe you're uh, an absolute uh, Pinterest-aholic like my wife. 
Um, maybe you, um, you know, maybe you find yourself perusing Facebook every day, you know, between four and five while you're at work. Um, let us know. Um, I, I personally tend to spend a lot of time on LinkedIn um, because um, I find it highly valuable and a great way to connect, but I'd love to hear from you. Um, okay, so Rob says LinkedIn, then Facebook, and then SlideShare. Very interesting. Rob, I love SlideShare too. Um, Twitter. We got some Twitter lovers here. That's great. Great. Um, this is, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Twitter person myself. Yeah, this is this is an extremely valuable exercise. Um, um, Bill likes Reddit, um, and I think this is this is really interesting because when you're 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 talking about your own social media strategy, you need, you need to think about your target market and think about where they're going to spend those three hours. Absolutely, except for of course the fact that we should all probably go outside a little more. But <laughs> notwithstanding, um, with your smartphone, you can be outside and tweeting. So win win. Um, there's a lot of ways you can do that. Some of the ways um, that you can do that are Facebook comments. This is a way to connect the content on your site right back to Facebook. Um, they are commenting on a blog of yours. They're commenting on a piece of content you've published, and it publishes that back to Facebook. And that creates a conversation there that inevitably leads back to your site and the content that you've put on it. Beyond that, Google Plus authorship. This is a big one. Um, this one actually touches on a lot of things because when you're uh, when you establish Google Plus authorship, what that does is it puts a real name and a real face, uh, not only in front of your visitors but in directly to Google. Google can look and see that this real person with this real name and a real Gmail, they are the an author. They contribute to uh, the content on this website. And that actually builds your trust level with Google a lot. And beyond that, in your search results, Google will actually display, display an image. Um, your face will be next to that search result um, in, in the Google, you know, when people are searching Google. And that um, has proven, study after study has proven that that increases the click-through rate on that result um, many times over. People like um, the face. They like having a picture there. It's a more rich result in Google, and people like to click it. And so that's a reason alone to establish uh, Google, Plus, Google Plus authorship. Uh, Twitter stream, you can actually embed um, your most recent tweets on your website. You might have seen this in different places. Uh, perhaps not. Uh, I don't see it. It doesn't seem like I see it often enough with local businesses. But uh, Twitter on your website says a lot of things. It says that you're up to date with social media and what's going on. Uh, when people actually see the tweets on your site and they can see that this person, they just tweeted this an hour ago, and I can see them replying to people an hour ago, two hours ago, it, it creates another avenue for potential customers to contact you, whether it be with questions about your service or product, whether it be uh, just an, as, as their first contact to try to start um, you know, developing that relationship, business relationship with you, it's it it's just it's just fantastic uh, for being able to build that kind of uh, connection and relationship. Last but not least, pinnable images. Um, depending on your business model, which although it really can apply to a whole lot, uh, whether you're doing something that's related to lawn care, whether you're doing something that's related to uh, fashion, whether it's uh, dresses, uh, suits. Um, Anything, even pest control, um, is one that can actually work. But if you the web, is, the images on your website, if I'm able to pin them directly from being on your website, if I can just click a little pin it button, um, that's going to increase uh, the number of times that happens, and people are going to pin it, and it's just going to that again introduces your website's content to a whole nother stream of people that are using social media that wouldn't have seen it otherwise. And so, again, totally worth doing those kind of things. So your homework here, make a Google Plus business page. Uh, that might sound a little daunting. If you're unfamiliar, don't worry. Uh, we do this kind of thing for a living, and we can help you do that. Uh, secondarily, add a like button to your blog posts. If they read something on your site and they like it, it's going to post that directly to their Facebook wall. Their Facebook, uh, it's going to be in all their friends' news feed. And that's the kind of thing that, again, puts your content in front of more eyes that weren't looking at it before. 
Last but not least, start actually using Pinterest. And I'm serious about it. If you can just start using it, there's a little bit of a learning curve, but feel free. Um, you know, uh, taking Herb's example, we can just ask your wife or significant other. They probably know a little more than you how to use it. And, and just get in there. And once you get using it and start to see how it works, you can really begin to see the opportunities that your business has uh, to be exposed to more people. So really, when it comes down to, at the end of the day, a website is best optimized for search engines when it's best optimized, period. And that includes all the things that we've talked about. When a website is highly effective, when it's, res it's resource-driven, when it's engaged with social media, when it tells a story and there's a name and a face, uh, when it's listening to its customers, all these things, uh, that's, that's a website that's absolutely best optimized for search engines. And that happens to be what we focus on, uh, making sure that all these areas and all these ways that you can maximize your website's impact are, are maximized. And I think that pretty much does it for the webinar. Now we're kind of opening the floor to any questions. Yeah, let me let me definitely. I'd love to hear any questions that anybody has, and you can ask right in the, right in the questions. A lot of you have asked some very some very strong questions. Um, so I'm just going to read some of the questions we've got already, um, real quick. Somebody asks, um, "Doesn't Pinterest have a high number of female users? So if my target mark audience is older males, would Pinterest even be worth my time?" Um, possibly. Kristen, um, I, I wouldn't say it'd be in, in my top two to three tactics. Um, and understanding your demographics and, and really doing some, some deep level persona development around that, that demographic um, is extremely valuable because the last thing you want to do is spend hours and hours and hours of valuable energy on marketing only to be barking up the wrong tree or barking up the wrong channel. So, you know, if you were, if I was, if I was aiming if my target market was older males, um, I would probably try to consider um, email marketing uh, much sooner than Pinterest. I'd have email marketing as one of my, my higher priority t uh, uh, tactics, and I'd probably have email marketing, specifically list building, to build a nice list, um, something that I'd be focusing my energy on. Okay, questions, questions. So, um, got a question. How can you attract businesses through LinkedIn outside of just building a profile? Um, I almost jumped in when Drew was talking about creating a, a forum um, because a very easy way to engage people within your vertical or even just within your, your, your business network um, um, through LinkedIn is to start a group. Start a LinkedIn group, and there's several business groups here locally in Gainesville. Um, Gainesville, area, Gainesville Area Business Leaders is one group that I can think of that I'm in. I just posted something on there this morning um, that I see John Spence posting in there frequently. Um, but you can start a, a, a group like that, and that helps increase brand awareness um, for not only the company you work for, but also for you and your personal LinkedIn profile. Okay, questions, questions. Um, got, a, got a question here. Um, how does, how does social media help you with your, with your search engine ranking, I think is what they're trying to say. How is social media helping you with your ranking? So I'm assuming you mean search engine ranking. And I, I'll let Drew kind of tee that one off. Well, I mean, it's, there's, uh, without getting too technical, there is a recipe or an algorithm um, that Google uses that combines a whole lot of different ingredients in order to actually rank a website based on any particular topic uh, for any particular search query. And social media is definitely one of those ingredients. It's not necessarily like uh, if you get a page liked a bunch of times, you'll automatically be the top for that. That's, it's, there's a whole lot more to it, but it's been shown that uh, that a, a particular page uh, that gets shared a lot 
on Google Plus, a particular page that gets tweeted about a lot, like a link that gets tweeted out a lot, it, it does rank higher than pages with similar content that are not tweeted about a lot, that are not liked a lot, that are not shared a lot on Facebook. So it, it's, 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 I can't exactly tell you literally how, except that uh, when content is shared more on social media, then it's, it raises, it, it, that, that's one of the signals that Google uses and it raises that signal um, for, for Google to see. And so the more often people are going to your website uh, and the, if you create good content, uh, people are going to share it on social media, especially when you optimize your site to make it easy for them to do that. And the, uh, basically, like it's sort of lots of secondary signals too, because if you share the website a lot on Facebook, well, people are going to uh, visit the site more. And traffic to the site is one of the things that Google also uses to determine rankings. Um, so it's it, you know, it sort of has many levels of impact there. So, you know, it's that hopefully that answers your question um, because, you know, there's Google takes it into account as a social level specifically, but also it impacts the levels of traffic to your site. And that in turn is another whole set of, um, that's a whole other factor Google looks at. So, Okay, next question. Um, and that was, Extremely thorough. Thank you, Drew. Um, and this is a, a question that uh, that is coming from Jordan at the Chamber, and um, he's asking, "Where does Google Plus rank with the other big social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, etc.?" And Jordan, let me tell you, this is almost a point of contention because a lot of people feel like Google is using its monopoly power to sort of strong arm people into using Google Plus. Um, and the reason why I say that is because, first of all, Google Plus is a social media platform not a whole lot different than, than Facebook. Um, for me personally, I like it better. I think it's easier to use. I think it's, it's, it's simpler. I think it takes the best features of Facebook and the best features of Twitter and kind of pops them all together and gives you a great social media platform. The problem is, is that, that people are already using Facebook. People are already using Twitter and they love them and they're kind of reticent to join another social media platform. So what Google's done is they've really increased the impact that Google Plus has in search rankings. And to give you an example, authorship. You can actually, I mean, if you do a search for Gainesville SEO tips, um, you'll probably find our website, and more than likely, you'll find um, my picture. And that is authorship data that we've actually included in the site that we're pulling directly from Google Plus. And Google Plus actually gives you, I, I think, a benefit in your search rankings. Um, and there's a, a few other reasons why Google Plus does help you. They've tied Google Plus directly into the local maps listings, Google Maps. So it, it's pretty important there. If you want to leave a review for a local business now on Google, you have to have a Google Plus account. Um, so it, it's pretty valuable to have. Um, but as far as overall usage, um, it's trailing way, way behind Facebook and behind Twitter as well. Well, we've, we were shooting for 45 minutes, and we're right on that now. If, if, does anybody have any other questions? Because if not, we want to keep everybody to under an hour, and um, we look forward to the next event. We're going to try to do these Gainesville expert um, webinars on a monthly basis on a whole variety of topics. I know upcoming speakers we have this summer are Eva Del Rio on HR, um, Jim Lilkendi um, from Apogee Coaching is going to be present, presenting on a webinar talking about personal and company time management. Um, so if you have any specific topics that you'd like to hear about, whether they're marketing related or whether they're related to some other aspect of your business, um, I'd love to hear them. So. One last question, and I think it's a good question. Drew, you might want to field this one. Um, <laughs> what's your number one link building tip for 2013? Oh, man. Goodness gracious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, you know, I, I don't really, I would probably have to say, um, if I had to pick one that I've been able, if I had to pick one right now 
is to give you a link building tip, it would be Indiegogo because um, it, it's it sort of um, it sort of formalizes, if I can use that term, the process of helping someone out and helping them and, and them being able to help you out in return uh, by getting a link. Uh, it, you know, if it's a, a, a local charity or a local restaurant that's trying to raise money to expand, and they put on there, hey, if you donate over a certain amount, we'll mention you on the website. And th it just builds that relationship and can often be used to turn that mention into a link. Um, so just get involved. Re really, it's, it, it works because it, gets, it boils down into building relationships in a community. And that, that is what, that's the real link building tip uh, for 2013 is because you really have to do that. Um, it, Indiegogo combines building relationships with generosity and um, in being in a, in a social media and community format. And those three together is, a, that's a recipe for a link building win every time. I hope that answers your question. I do want to mention that we'll be having uh, this um, slide deck will be on SlideShare, and we'll probably publish it on our web on the uh, blog as well. And we're recording this, I believe. Um, kind of like Herb was recording it, and um, so we'll be posting that as soon as we can. And if you follow, uh, we're on Twitter now, op underscore inc, and that's us on Twitter. So feel free to follow us if you're on Twitter. If not, you should go ahead and join. And we will uh, be posting links uh, to the slide deck and the webinar when we can get those up. You there, Herb? Yep, yep. Everyone, thank you very much for your time. Um, we're going to go ahead and close out now. And if you have any further questions, please feel free to email um, either of us, drew at online-potential.com or Herb at online-potential.com. Fill out a contact us um, form on our website. We'd be more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, and have a great day.